Howdy, and welcome to a bonus episode of Wise About Texas. By now, I hope you've listened to both episodes of the Bonnie and Clyde series. And this bonus episode is going to consist of an interview with Dr. Jody Yen. Jody is a Ph.D. historian and assisted Netflix with its newest production called The Highwaymen. This movie tells the story of the chase for Bonnie and Clyde from the perspective of Texas Rangers Frank Hamer and Manny Galt. I had the good fortune and privilege to work with Jody gathering some of the historical material in connection with the movie, and we sat down the morning after the world premiere of The Highwaymen to talk about making historical movies, the myths surrounding Bonnie and Clyde, and what it's like to work with Netflix on this project. So let's get to it. An interview with Dr. Jody Ginn. Dr. Ginn, thank you very much for rejoining Wise About Texas. Thank you for having me back. Well, this is your second appearance on the show, and why don't you remind our listeners of your background, and then we'll get into some Bonnie and Clyde. Sounds great. I hold a PhD in history and a master's in public history. The, well, sorry, let's start over. I hold a PhD in American history from the University of North Texas and a master's in public history from Texas State University. I work primarily as a consultant for uh, multimedia projects like museums and documentary films, book projects. Why don't you tell our listeners, they have just heard um, some information on Bonnie and Clyde, some of the most famous outlaws in American history, tell us your connection to that time period and your interest in Bonnie and Clyde? Well, historian is a uh, midlife career change for me and that came about because uh, I have an ancestor who was a Texas Ranger in the same period as Bonnie and Clyde. In fact, he worked undercover for uh, Frank Hamer, the legendary Ranger captain who eventually tracked down and killed Bonnie and Clyde um, prior to that time and then became one of the first uh, Department of Public Safety Texas Rangers when that was formed in 1935. And so uh, in researching, and we talked about this last time you were on the show, but in researching your Ranger ancestor, you came across a lot of Bonnie and Clyde material because they dominated that time period in law enforcement, didn't they? That is correct. In the, in the various state records, the governor's records, court records, trial transcripts that were not even relevant specifically to Bonnie and Clyde, and other uh, state legislature uh, hearings, uh, documents, that sort of thing, they come up everywhere during that period, absolutely. We'll talk a little bit about, from from a historian's perspective, kind of your take on Bonnie and Clyde and the time period, and and what what was the atmosphere like during that time. They They were romanticized, really, at the time, weren't they? Even at the time, they, they were highly romanticized, um, you know, portrayed in the media as the, these kind of, uh, you know, anti-establishment figures and people really kind of adopted that perspective on them, even though it was really far from what they actually did. Well, what did they actually do? What characterized that? Because you used to be in law enforcement at one time. So uh, give us that perspective. How do you think of Bonnie and Clyde? They were small time violent criminals. They started in thefts and robberies, and then as uh, their past would catch up to them, they became unwilling to accept responsibility for those acts, and therefore they started killing people to avoid uh, being held accountable and being captured. Well, that's an interesting take on it. What, um, when you say avoid being held accountable, tell us more about that. Well, Clyde had been to prison. Uh, Bonnie's husband was in prison. She was never divorced. She was married to him the entire time she was with Clyde. Uh, he was he was a felon. He was in for probably most of the rest of his life. Um, uh, and it's, that's the environment they came out of in the 20s. Uh, they they had been they had both been involved in the criminal world since the 1920s, um, uh, early in their lives, and and so Clyde had served some prison time. Uh, Bonnie even served some jail time. And so they decided they didn't want to go back, and they were willing to take as many lives as were necessary in order to not go back. Were they killing for fun? 
or do you think? I mean, were they murderers or by trade, or do you think that was just an evolution of their petty thefts and car thefts, et cetera? That's a big argument you get, and I think with Clyde, I'm willing to accept the argument that um, he wasn't doing it for enjoyment, that he was um, simply doing it to avoid going back to prison. Uh, still cold-blooded murder to you know take somebody else's life so that you don't have to be held accountable for your choices. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm willing to accept based on the evidence that as assessment of Clyde, but I'm increasingly coming to the, um, uh, the idea that perhaps Bonnie was getting to enjoy it. Really? Yes. Because one of the great uh, myths, if you will, is that Bonnie was just a tag along in love with Clyde, a young girl that he turned bad, which, which would have been uh, promoted at the time, given women's place in society, they weren't considered often capable of making their own decisions back then, really. Uh, but that's not true, is it? No, not at all. Bonnie was very much in, in, in control of her destiny and making her choices in life, and she gravitated to, to, to men like Clyde. Well, let's, uh, let's switch gears and talk about what, what started the idea for this interview, and that is a brand new movie on Netflix called The Highwaymen, uh, which takes a little bit different perspective on the Bonnie and Clyde story. Uh, listeners may remember the 1967 movie Bonnie and Clyde with Faye Dunaway and Warren Beatty. Talk a little bit about that movie as a historian watches a movie. Well, that is an area of my particular research. That film was most certainly a highly romanticized version of Bonnie and Clyde. It essentially used their names and the names of a couple of other historic figures from that time, but the story it told was almost completely fictionalized. Um, and it was a groundbreaking film in the industry, and I won't pretend to have the expertise to analyze that, but it is, it's very respected as a piece of film art. Um, and so it had a wide range. Now, interestingly, at the time, the, many of the first reviews of it were overwhelmingly negative. Even the New York Times uh, uh, really ripped the film for, for romanticizing, specifically for romanticizing Bonnie and Clyde. But there was this woman who was the predominant movie reviewer of that time period, whose name escapes me at the moment, um, who she came out in favor of it. And after that, everybody else fell in line. And since that time, there really hadn't been another take on the Bonnie and Clyde story until now. And, it, and, this, and the Highwaymen, uh, and I'll mention to the listeners that we're taping this interview the day after the world premiere at the South by Southwest Festival in Austin, uh, which we both had the privilege of attending. Um, but as a historian, why don't you tell the listeners about your work on this new movie, The Highwaymen? Well, that goes back again to my answers to who was a ranger who worked for <laughs> Frank Hamer. And when I began my research back in 2000, uh, I was working as a deputy constable uh, still in Hayes County and came to learn in the process of my research that Frank Hamer Jr. Uh, lived there in San Marcos and uh, was introduced to him by a uh, fellow uh, retired game warden of his. He had, he had spent a career as a game warden pilot. And, um, and Frank was not easy to reach. Frank was very, um, for lack of a better word, reclusive and, and protective uh, as a result of the 67 film and the humiliation that his family faced uh, as, uh, coming out of that film. And so he didn't trust easily. And so it was only through the three-part connection of, A, he knew who my ancestor was, I worked in law enforcement at the time, and a fellow law enforcement person that he had known for decades gave me a reference. And as a result, he invited me to his home and uh, we established a friendship. And so over time, he did get to talking to me about Bonnie and Clyde. In fact, I had a myth in my family uh, surrounding uh, the notion that one of my ancestors had been asked to go with him on that pursuit and I asked him about that and he made it very clear as I had already expected that the only person Frank had ever asked for was Manny Galt and so uh, that's why the conversation came up and so as the years went by I visited with him regularly and when he had his meeting with John Fusco uh, who 
<clears throat> I didn't know at the time. Again, I wasn't you know involved in any of that sort of thing in the film industry at that time, and still in law enforcement. He, uh, but he told me about he had met this uh, screenwriter John Fusco who had written a script. He had met with them. He has blessed. He had blessed the script, and that it was going to tell his father's side of the story and his father's perspective. Okay, Doctor Ginn, tell us about this new movie, The Highwaymen. Tell us, you know, who wrote it, directed, and and how it came about. Well, this movie was the brainchild, the passion project of a man named John Fusco, who is a A-list Hollywood screenwriter. He has written such things as Young Guns, Young Guns Two, Hidalgo. More recently, the Netflix series Marco Polo, and uh, many, 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 many more. And he found out, you know, he, of course, he, you know, knew the 67 film, but he said that he was suspicious of that take on those events in that time. And he had already seen, you know, some things he had read that raised a lot of questions for him. And so over the years, he started looking into it. And the more he learned, especially the more he learned about Frank Hamer and who Frank Hamer was coming up to that period, already the most famous lawman in Texas uh, at that time, um, he, he recognized that that film had been a grave injustice and he wanted to tell Frank's story. And he set about that process. Well, in fact, what a lot of people don't know is uh, after that 1967 movie, uh, Gladys Hamer, Frank Hamer's widow, uh, sued Warner Brothers, settled out of court, uh, essentially for portraying Frank Hamer as a hapless buffoon, which he was anything but that. Um, and so, did Fusco want to right that wrong, sort of, in your in your mind? Absolutely, he's expressed that he he wanted to right that wrong and and to 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 redeem Hamer's public image. All right. Well, tell us about your work on the Highwaymen. So, as I mentioned before, I had heard about Fusco from Frank Jr. and that Jr. had blessed the project. And I'd had brief contact with, with Mr. Fusco in 2006 at the time of Jr.'s passing. Uh, but I was still in law enforcement at that time. A year ago, February, I saw the deadline article that the movie was now going into production. Now, it had originally been slated to start production back in 2006 with Paul Newman in the lead and Robert Redford as Manny Galt. Uh, but due to Newman's health, that you know eventually fell apart, and it went dormant for many years. And so when it stepped back up, <clears throat> and I saw that deadline article, uh, I checked my email. I still had Mr. Fusco's email, and frankly, on a lark, sent him an email and said, "Don't know if you'll remember me, but I am now a historian. I've done research on this particular topic, so if I can be of any help, uh, you know, let me know." He emailed me back in 20 minutes. We started a conversation. They were already in production, so I didn't get to be involved on that end of things. Uh, but uh, when it came time in November for to start the publicity run, he reached back out to me and, uh, and uh, put me together with John Lee Hancock, the director, who's of course known for the Alamo, the blind side, saving Mr. Banks. Uh, he's a Texas native from Texas City, Baylor graduate. And, uh, and they decided to hire me after I did a historical analysis of the, analysis of the film for them. So you were hired um, to uh, sort of evaluate the history in the movie and in connection with the release? That is correct. And you're doing some work with Netflix on a companion documentary. Tell us about that. Yeah, they gave me a variety of assignments. I did the historical analysis. I helped them prepare their press scripts for Mr. Harrelson and Mr. Costner. Um, and have worked with their publicity department, uh, doing interviews with some um, some of the national press, and then they have pro they're in, in the process of producing some mini documentaries, some behind the scenes history behind the film type of, uh, of, of vignettes that will uh, uh, appear online and may appear on Netflix alongside the film. All right. Well, we don't want to give away any spoilers, but uh, I will say, having seen it uh, already that this movie focuses on Frank Hamer and Manny Galt um, chasing Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde are in the movie, uh, but the focus is on the chase. Talk briefly about who Frank Hamer was and who Manny Galt was. Frank Hamer 
was uh, before Bonnie and Clyde ever happened was the most respected lawman in Texas. He had been a Texas Ranger and had served in a number of other law enforcement positions for decades. He had been a, a marshal in Navasota. He had been a federal pro, uh, prohibition officer, including the chief prohibition officer based out of Austin. And he had risen through the ranks of the Rangers to become chief of the Texas Rangers. He, he had worked the, the, the valley and the border and he had worked the boom towns uh, in the oil industry, especially, and uh, the Prohibition era, and all that sort of thing. And um, he had established, a, you know, a tremendous uh, reputation, uh, widely respected, um, not totally without controversy, uh, and also as a formidable opponent who w would meet violence with violence. What about Manny Gold? Manny Galt came in much later. He was Frank's neighbor. Uh, Frank lived on Riverside Drive in Austin, and Manny lived just around the corner. And so they were neighbors long before Manny was a ranger, and so he came to know Manny personally very well, and actually started using, much like my ancestor, Manny started working for Frank doing undercover work uh, before he became a regular ranger in 1929, at which point he would, uh, a lot of his career was spent going into those oil boom towns. So when Frank Hamer was given the assignment to track down Bonnie and Clyde, he wanted Manny Galt by his side. Well, <clears throat> once, once he got to that point, he initially started, he was primarily working on his own. He collaborated with other agencies, the Dallas Sheriff's Office in particular, the FBI also. And so sometimes uh, different officers or agents would ride along with him for brief periods. But he was mainly working solo up until the point of the Grapevine murders. Well, let's talk a little bit about historical movies, because the, the, the American movie catalog is replete with movies that purport to tell stories of history, but it's important to realize these are not documentaries. Right. As a public historian, that's really what I learned. The different types of mediums that you use to convey historical knowledge have their, each have their own limitations. And feature dramatic reenactment film is no different. And you're having to compress time and compress events into an hour and a half, a two hour period, and that, that presents challenges and that, that limits uh, the uh, amount of nuance that you can often you know, uh, portray and the, uh, and the amount of detail that you can, can put in and, and really reflect accurately. Well, as John Fusco told us uh, personally last night, he was really trying to capture the essence of Frank Hamer and the director of course, uh, is trying to communicate that with uh, through the movie, using devices that directors use that, that Hollywood uses to communicate the truth, even though maybe that event didn't happen exactly it was as it was depicted. That said, in your opinion as a historian who's researched the Bonnie and Clyde times, do you think uh, that they succeeded, accomplished their goal, and captured Frank Hamer as he was? I think they absolutely captured Frank Hamer and that that portrayal is completely authentic, yes. As a historian, when you watch a historical movie uh, or a movie depicting historical events, is it hard for you to ignore some of the detail and, and really focus on the essence of the story? Or do you look at every gun and every car and every hat and wonder if it's right or not? It, it does get challenging. In my initial review, um, was a very detailed. I'm not so much into the material culture, though I do notice it. Like I was happy that they did not have Frank and Manny use Tommy guns, even though they 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 show them buy one at one point, but they don't have them using. They have them using Bay ARs and shotguns and that sort of thing. Um, so I am aware of that stuff. I'm not quite as concerned about that as in the story that they're telling. And is there you know are there historical accuracies inaccuracies there? Are they misrepresenting? the the people and how, who they were how they were what they would have done well let's talk about the story then as this movie uh, portrays it and compare it to the original movie we've talked about uh, the the Hamer family actually suing Warner Brothers over the original movie um, compare uh, the myths that the original movie portrayed uh, versus the realities that this movie portrays well, two things. One is the romanticizing of Bonnie and Clyde as anti-establishment, sort of, you know, Robin Hood bank robbers. 
Um, and you got to remember this is set in the Depression era where banks are foreclosing on people's property because they're in failing and sometimes keeping their money, not letting people get their money, all these sort of things. So banks had really become the bad guy in the Great Depression. And so anybody that was robbing banks, the, a lot of the general public, you know, didn't have a lot of sympathy for the banks. And, <clears throat> and certainly if those people would have been robbing banks and sharing any of that with the greater public, then that would have, you know, you know been well received. Uh, but the reality is that wasn't happening. In fact, Bonnie and Clyde only ever tried to rob three banks, and those were dismal failures. Um, and in fact, they were considered a laughing stock among the serious criminals of that time who had wanted nothing to do with them. Even some of their gang members along the way left because they said, you know, Clyde's not a serious criminal. Most of their victims were mom and pop shops and just individuals on the street. Dr. Kim, we've talked about how the 1967 Bonnie and Clyde movie romanticized them, Bonnie and Clyde unfairly, and how this movie accurately portrays Frank Hamer and accurately portrays, uh, or more accurately portrays the events that occurred. Um, talk about a couple of the big myths about Bonnie and Clyde growing out of that 1967 film and uh, debunk them for us and talk about how this the Highwaymen treats them. Well, the first myth, the first major myth is the notion of them as Depression era, Robin Hood, any establishment sticking it to the man, sharing with, you know, the, the downtrodden. They didn't do any of that. Um, they weren't really bank robbers. They only tried three banks and they were unsuccessful. Uh, they mainly robbed the, ver the, they mainly robbed the, you know, the working class and downtrodden, small mom and pop you know, uh, grocery stores. There, there were no Walmarts at this time. These were individual stores that, you know, were surviving by the skin of their teeth like everyone else in the Great Depression. And just, you know, sometimes just robbing people on the street and stealing their cars and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> they also, the whole thing, the notion that the whole they turned to crime as a result of the Depression and what they did is all a product of the Depression is also uh, not supported historically because a they were involved in their criminal lives well before the Great Depression took hold, both of them, and um, the the other p problem with that is that really does a disservice to the millions of Americans who suffered and survived through the Great Depression and never killed anyone. One of the things that I noticed about the Highwaymen is uh, the portrayal of Bonnie as really a killer mm -hmm. and uh, cold-blooded. Uh, is that accurate? It is, but that is the second big myth. Uh, there is a, um, a small but, but uh, vocal contingent that insists that Bonnie was <clears throat> basically an innocent bystander in Clyde's crimes, in the gang's crimes, that she was just a girl led astray and that she never fired a gun. I mean, some literally say she never fired a gun. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, now, they focus on the events at Grapevine on uh, April 1st, Easter Sunday of 1934. Who focuses on that? The, the, the pro-Bonnie, the Bonnie, what do we call the Bonnie apologists. Gotcha. And um, they try to pick apart the information from that time and they, they, they kind of selectively acknowledge certain things and they ignore some other things and they make some claims for which they've produced no evidence. Uh, and, and some of these things are in books. These aren't just verbal arguments. There's a couple of books out there that, that make these arguments, but they produce no evidence to, to back them up. The key, and, and that revolves around there was an eyewitness who very clearly and consistently across time, both to the press and to law enforcement and in court, testified that it was a man and a woman, and it was a woman who was the second shooter and who walked up to the uh, trooper who didn't die in the first volley and executed him at point-blank range and laughed afterwards. And that, uh, that, is, uh, that event was rather dramatically portrayed in The Highwaymen, and, and in your estimation as a historian, more accurately portrayed. Absolutely, for the first time. Okay, tell us a little bit more about this myth that Bonnie was some innocent. What, what is, especially with respect to the, what we call the grapevine murders, where Bonnie and Clyde just shot in cold blood two state troopers. What, um, what are some of the things that the Bonnie apologists talk about 
Well, first of all, <clears throat> they try to say that, uh, they say that, they claim that Schiffer either recanted. I think it was Schiffer, the eyewitness. Uh, the eyewitness. Yeah. They claimed that the eyewitness, and there was a second couple of eyewitness as well, who said things slightly different, but not so much that it, and they had, they had only drove up at the last minute. The, the primary eyewitness that had observed the, the Bonnie and Clyde for hours, uh, and had seen them basically what he described, what he, picnicking and... Um, and the term he used at the time uh, was necking. They were kissing, you know, extensively over a period of a couple few hours while they were waiting there. And, um, and described uh, Bonnie, uh, they were both dressed the same in slacks, in tan slacks and so forth. Uh, so, and which will explain why the other couple mistook her as a man. Um, but, uh, but he very clearly stated that she had very fluffy, curly hair, um, which, the person who the Abani apologist does not match their does not match their description whatsoever. Secondly, um, so they claim that they claim that sh that the eyewitness recanted and or was discredited at some point. They produced no evidence to support that. Um, <clears throat> secondly, um, they claim that. Henry Medvin, the gang member who was, by his own statements, asleep in the car at the time, they claimed that he was the one that was outside and he was the one uh, that, um, that shot and not Bonnie. Well, there's several problems with that, particularly that Kev Medvin never admitted that anywhere. Uh, the claim comes from Bonnie's mother. Bonnie's mother, who incidentally was later convicted and sentenced to federal prison for aiding and abetting. And as was, <clears throat> as was Clyde's mother and many of both of their extended family. And so, um, so that's where that claim comes from. That's uh, to begin with. And like I say, there's no other evidence for that. And so the last part about Bonnie's myth as being an innocent victim, they focus on Grapevine, as we've discussed. But in addition to that, she was involved in nine other shootings, where in six of those shootings, um, uh, or in, in six of those events, six people were murdered as a result of those six shootings. And in a new, several of those events, she was identified as the first shooter or the primary shooter. And in fact, two of those events, it's documented that Clyde actually chastised her later for shooting too quickly. So Dr. Ginn, talk to, a little bit to the listeners about um, when you come in as a historian, and historians like judges tend to think in straight lines and try to work just with facts and if there's no evidence it doesn't go in. Compare that to, to the director and the writer with whom you're working who are trying to paint a historical picture on film that may not depend on strict detail. Talk about is, is there tension there and how do you resolve that? Working with feature films is, is very unique and you do have to, both sides have to accept some limitations on their approach that's what a collaboration is all about. You kind of bring these things together and you, and so you try to get, you know, you try to get as close, you know, and, and, and come to a compromise. Now, like I mentioned, I was not involved on the front end. Uh, and so I didn't influence the script and the, the story that you see. So is there, a, is there a line that, is there a clear line that you just don't want to cross? I mean, obviously, uh, if you put a, a modern day uh, military uh, weapon in the hands of a 1930s a killer, that's you're going to lose the audience. But wh where is that line? Where yeah, there in and that's that that line is there's a big gray area in the middle there. And for some people, that line is much sharper than others, and is much further one direction or another than others. You know, for 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 most creatives, um, you know, they are interested in building a story around, and they'll use something as. Um, as inspiration, but they're not really concerned about the historical detail. Uh, that, and but 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 John Fusco and John Lee Hancock are maybe somewhat unique in the industry in that regard. That uh, that they that they were concerned with this story of of really getting it right, and especially in terms of Frank Hamer's portrayal. And um, and they're they're looking for this authenticity. Now there's the detail you have to you have to be willing to work with because the fact is they have to write dialogue. Well, we don't know what these people said to each other. We don't know what Frank Hamer and Manny Galt said to get each other on the thousands of miles that they covered. Um, and so they have to they have to create that dialogue. 
and they have to you know help forward the story with that dialogue so so you have to be a little flexible in that regard as long as it's authentic and that's what they're going for is does, does what they're having them say seem authentic to the time and place and the people okay well the movie uh, clearly focuses on Frank Hamer but Manny Galt of course is sort of his foil his sidekick whatever you want to call it from a movie making perspective but the Manny Galt that Woody Harrelson portrays in The Highwayman is not intended to be exactly like Manny Galt was, is that right? That's correct, not in the same vein as Frank Hamer. This is Frank Hamer's story, and so Manny is there in name, and um, uh, a lot of what is there is, is you know, reflects Manny's involvement. But the character in the film that that uh, Woody portrays is a composite character, what they call a composite character. He's a mix of several different people that had worked with Frank over the years. So that's an example of the movie makers taking a historical figure, uh, incorporating other characteristics in order to shine the spotlight, so to speak, on Frank Hamer and his, his character. That is absolutely correct. All right, Dr. Ginn, well, thank you for once again being a guest on Wise About Texas, and we will look forward to the release of The Highwaymen in late March 2019 on Netflix. Thank you very much for having me again. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this bonus episode of Wise About Texas. Thanks for tuning in today, and go check out The Highwaymen, starring Kevin Costner and Woody Harrelson, currently playing on Netflix. And let me know what you think at host at wiseabouttexas.com. Don't forget, we're on Instagram and Twitter at wiseabouttexas. And like and share the Wise About Texas Facebook page. And if you get a minute, leave us a review on iTunes. That'll help other people find the show. Thanks again for listening today. Go out and do something for Texas. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.